Okay. Okay. So, uh, Lucia, if you want, you can uh, show your presentation now. Okay. So, we see it perfectly. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody to this new session of the Simna Seminar course. Um, today, we're pleased to have with us uh, Professor Lucia Barbu. Lucia Barbu is a Serra Hunter lecturer at the Technical University of Catalonia and also an affiliated scientist at CIMNE, uh, where she's leading the fatigue unit. She has obtained her PhD in structural analysis in 2016 at UPC and has continued to, to pursue research in computational solid mechanics in the following years, with a special emphasis on the constitutive modeling of fatigue processes for steel and composite materials, as well as on developing computational methods for the nonlinear analysis of stressed structures. Today, Lucia is going to talk us about numerical framework for fatigue simulation that she has been developing. Lucia, can you wish? Uh, I think you're muted. Yes, definitely. Now, now you can hear me well, I hope. Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay. Well, um, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ignacio. Um, let me just say that it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be with you in person because I'm still um, COVID positive. But, um, well, it's still an opportunity for us to, to share with you, for our research group to share with you our knowledge on fatigue, even if in this virtual format. Uh, I apologize also if I have any coughing or sore throat. Uh, throat. Still, I, I have some issues with this, so sorry for the noise, okay? Um, okay, now. Uh, today, I want to, to share with you um, the work we've been doing in the past years regarding uh, the numerical simulation of fatigue processes in our group. And when I say our group, uh, you know me, uh, Nazi has just presented me, I'm Lucia Barbo. Uh, together, I work with Alejandro Cornejo, who is, who is a postdoc researcher in our, uh, in our fatigue unit. Then we have Sergio Jimenez, who is a PhD candidate, who is just finishing uh, writing his thesis, he's finishing his PhD, and uh, he will be defending his, uh, his thesis, hopefully in October this year. Then we have some uh, new PhD students who are uh, working with us. We are very happy to have them. Luis Antonio Gonzalez has joined us from Brazil, uh, working on fatigue and the influence of manufacturing processes on the fatigue behavior of, of metals. Then we have uh, Ali Adireza, who is joining us from Iran, and he's working on composites um, under fatigue and also uh, a formulation for the lamination. And we have Barbara Alcaide also with us. She's a naval engineer, studied here in Barcelona, uh, and she's working on, on the composite behavior um, uh, of the fatigue behavior of composite materials, um, helping us with a specific application for the automotive industry. Now, all of us are very lucky to have um, collaborated and, and received very good advice from Professor Sergio Yet, who is a former uh, full professor of, of UPC, of the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, and also CIMNE. Professor Oyer has retired in the past years. He's working uh, in Argentina now, but uh, he's um, collaborating us, with us uh, quite regularly on, on whatever issue may arise. Okay. Now, <clears throat> my objective for today is to share with you uh, the approach proposed from CIMNE for the analysis of fatigue processes. Today, I will focus on metals, and I will just touch very briefly on composites, because that's, there's not enough time to speak about everything. Uh, and I want to begin my presentation with a general overview of fatigue and some general issues, some general concepts which are relevant for fatigue um, that's important for all of us to know beforehand. Then I want to speak about the uh, formulation we've developed at CIMNE for different types of fatigue, high cycle, ultra low cycle, and um, I will center my presentation on low cycle fatigue, which is the challenge nowadays, at least for us. Um, and afterwards, I want to speak about some uh, future work that we're planning on developing. Um, basically, what about the simulation of manufacturing processes, which have a significant influence on the fatigue behavior? What about thermal fatigue, another hot topic? And I want to close with a short comment on composites. Okay, now, um, when we are speaking about fatigue, what are we referring to? Now, I hope all of you know, and if not, this is a good opportunity for you to find out. 
that fatigue is uh, associated with cyclic loading. And this is a, um, a type of loading which induces inside the material when fatigue is recorded, a permanent progressive and localized structural change. Okay, so we have alteration in the material properties um, due to this uh, continuous application of the cyclic load. And um, the most widely known instrument that uh, is generally used in the fatigue domain are the Wohler curve or the stress number of cycle curves. You can see an example here in the picture that uh, you have on the screen. And this is a good um, uh, way of showing you the different types of fatigue that can be found are actually represented on this SN curve. For instance, in this right part of the curve, we can see uh, the behavior of high cycle fatigue. High cycle fatigue is characterized by quite large fatigue lives in the order of millions of cycles, hundreds of thousands of cycles. Um, primarily, we have elastic deformation inside the material, and the stress levels are quite low, uh, below the yield threshold. Okay? The fracture associated with high cycle fatigue is written, and I want to say that this is what was uh, initially uh, understood as fatigue. In the 1960s, when fatigue be became an issue worldwide, um, this is what this is what was conventionally associated to fatigue. This concept of high cycle fatigue. Okay? Now, later on, um, there was also another type of fatigue um, developed or understood in, in literature, which is ultra low cycle fatigue, which is the other end of the spectrum. Here we have uh, quite uh, low fatigue lives in the order of dozens of cycles, maybe hundreds of cycles. Um, we, we are dealing with a behavior which is completely different from high cycle fatigue. We have advanced plastic deformation, and the stress level is considerably greater than the yield limit. And the fracture in this case is very ductile. Now, in the middle, we have this uh, gray shady area, uh, which I will call low cycle fatigue. Um, the lights are in between the two poles that I mentioned. So let's say about thousands of cycles, hundreds of thousands of cycles tens of thousands of cycles. We can have plastic deformation, of course, at several different levels. Um, and the stress levels are close to the yield limit when we are closer to the high cycle domain. And they progressively increase as we uh, get closer to the ultra low cycle fatigue zone. OK, now let's see a little bit uh, what the characteristic uh, state of the art would be, what the industry does, what the researcher do in each of these types of fatigue. Now, regarding the ultra low cycle fatigue, I would say this is um, somehow the newest fatigue um, area, uh, which is studied in, in literature. And here is um, the, the area where mostly we have research based work. So we have a lot of models developed ever since 2003, 2004, 1995. Uh, in our group, Professor Xavier Martinez has also proposed uh, a model specifically developed for ultra low cycle fatigue. I will explain uh, later on uh, um, its particularities. And this is, uh, I would say, the area which is uh, further away from the industry at this specific moment. Now, low cycle fatigue um, is somewhat more um, uh, standard or more uh, taken into account by the industry because we have some uh, standard rules which are implemented in different fatigue uh, softwares. For instance, the coffin Manson rule, which is, I believe, the most widely used. The Baskin rule, the moral rule. Here is an area where normally you find damage and plasticity models sometimes joined together. And uh, most of the models which are developed in, in this area are based on, on two um, base models, I would say, which is Chavosh model and Lumetric Chavosh, developed in 1988 and in 1990. Now, there are a lot of researchers who are working in this area, but a lot of the models which are proposed nowadays are generally extensions are based on these two um, models. Now, <clears throat> regarding the high cycle fatigue domain, uh, this is the, the domain which is um, closer to the industry, I would say, because uh, every um, car manufacturer, uh, uh, part manufacturer uh, is uh, worried about fatigue. They have uh, their paying uh, licenses for specific fatigue developed plugins such as ENCODE, for instance, which is very famous and very well documented, uh, FEMFAT, EFISAFE, uh, Fatigue Plus. There are a lot of softwares uh, out there for high cycle fatigue um, domain. And um, generally, what you will find in this area is um, a preponderance of damage models, majority of damage models, 
they are based on SN curve, on the polar curve. Um, and uh, in the case that where we have a combination of sidekick loading, you will find that most people and most softwares also use the minor rule, which is a linear uh, damage accumulation rule, um, uh, summing up the damage due to each different type of cyclic load. Also, there is a, another family of models which has been proposed in the last years. Um, I would say starting from 2014, 2015, which is the critical plane approach, um, which has its own particularities. It's interesting if, uh, for you to, to check it out if uh, you're curious about this. However, this is not the approach that we are using at Phoenix. Now, um, I would say as a, as a general overview, what's important for us to note here that there's no universally approved constitutive model, okay? Um, and conventional models here require regular cycles to predict fatigue life. And another conclusion that uh, we can draw after um, reading a lot of literature from the different types of fatigue is that no model can describe the three types of fatigue together um, or transitions in between one type and the other using the same thermodynamical framework. Now, um, just to, to make our uh, talk smoother later on, I want to establish a base for uh, specific uh, terms that you will be hearing throughout my talk, okay? Now, when we are dealing with cyclic loading, we have a cyclic force or a cyclic displacement which is applied on a specific geometry. And this cyclic load, force or displacement, induces inside our geometry a cyclic stress state at each specific, for instance, finite element or specific integration point of a finite element. Okay, so we have a stress state, cyclic, uh, at each integration point, and we can compute based on this specific stress state a reversion factor, stress ratio, it's called this R factor, which is the ratio between the minimum level of stress recorded at that integration point with the maximum level of stress recorded at the same integration point. So throughout our geometry, all of the um, integration points inside all of the finite elements, they have their own specific stress ratio. Of course, we can compute what is the maximum level of stress inside the whole geometry, what is the maximum stress ratio um, uh, inside our geometry, etc. But just to, to explain what is this stress ratio. Then, what's also important for fatigue formulations, especially in the high cycle fatigue domain, is what's this maximum level of stress recorded either at each integration point or whole geometry. Also, the mean stress, the minimum level of stress recorded, because here you, have, you can have different types of, uh, of cyclic loading. For instance, completely oscillating, where you have zero mean stress, or you can have tensile mean stress, uh, et cetera. Also, you can record the amplitude of the cyclic loading and of the amplitude of the stress state induced by the cyclic loading. I want to be precise here, okay? Okay, now, all of these um, cyclic loadings applied on specific components, they induce um, a change in the material properties. And these changes, they are recorded um, for a specific geometry by means of the stress uh, number of cycle polar curves. What's important for, for me to, to explain to you is that there is no single uh, stress number of cycle curve. There is a whole family of polar curves, which uh, each specific stress ratio, for instance, has associated a specific uh, polar curve. So we can uh, somehow understand the concept of SN curves as a smooth surface, okay, which vary with the reversion factor. An important concept also to understand is that the Wooler curves, um, at they tend, as we accumulate the number of cycles for very high fatigue lives, millions of cycles, they tend to an asymptotic behavior for most metallic materials, not so for aluminum alloys, okay, but most materials, um, most metals, exhibit this type of asymptotic um, um, behavior with large, I mean, large lives, millions of number of cycles. And this, uh, the level, the stress level associated to this asymptotic line, this is the endurance limit, or what is very commonly known as the fatigue limit. And this is the limit that's very important for the industry, specifically when they design for high cycle fatigue loading. Because if you manage to maintain the stress state inside your specific component that you're interested in developing below this endurance limit, then you have no fatigue behavior. You will have no alteration of material properties as you apply the cyclic load. This is a very uh, easy way to design, I would say. Um, and this is basically the, the main design practice in the past um, 20 years or so. However, 
uh, throughout globally, I would say, uh, in, in transversally in, in all different industries, we are in a process um, of uh, greening out uh, our manufacturing processes, um, the way we, we uh, design components, the way we, we handle uh, mechanical parts, etc. And in this sense, there is a large trend regarding lightweighting. So as we reduce, for instance, the weight, as we reduce the thickness of different um, mechanical parts, then we start to have uh, higher stress levels. And this design, or which keeps the stress level below the elastic limit, is no longer feasible in many cases. This is why um, all the different formulations for high cycle fatigue developed throughout in, in the research world, they start to have a lot of uh, importance and there's industry starting to be very, very interested about this. Okay, now, uh, regarding the failure due to fatigue, um, let's just say that, that there is a characteristic pattern when you see a, a fatigue failure surface. Uh, basically, you have uh, fatigue initiates uh, in an origin, which is uh, generally found close to a defect in the, in the internal structure of the material. It can be a large pore, it can be an inclusion, etc. Then you have uh, this area where you have a propagation, of, of uh, the crack, which has initiated that effect, where you can see this clamshell pattern. And in the end, uh, when we propagate it throughout the cross section until uh, you reduce uh, this cross section to, to such a small level that you can no longer bear the load, then you have a final fracture, which is quite brittle. Now, uh, another concept that is important uh, to, to establish at the beginning, uh, when we are dealing with cyclic loads, I don't want you to think that we, are, we always have regular cyclic loading, because this is not the case. This is the simplest case possible. But a lot of the mechanical components that are, uh, industry use these days, they are dealing with either with sequences of regular cyclic loads or combinations of different cyclic loads. And here, for instance, you need a, um, a rule which helps you sum the effects, the damage effects, for instance, of each one of these blocks. The most widely used is the minor rule with uh, linear damage accumulation. But also you can be dealing with irregular cyclic loading. And in these cases, you need to take into account that you, you have to use a cycle, uh, cycle counting technique, such as rain flow, I would say is the most uh, famous one. And after you, you um, divide this irregular cyclic load into uh, cycles with um, similar characteristics, you group them and you apply them into a specific order, then you can apply the minor rule. Okay, now let's go to the same, uh, similar formulation for high cycle fatigue. Now, this is not a, a new formulation. We've developed uh, it uh, a long time ago, I would say. Uh, during my PhD, actually, I worked on this, uh, on this formulation also. Uh, and let's just say that it, it, uh, it's based on a very simple damage model. Okay, you can see the constitutive over there. But this continuum damage model by itself is not sensitive to fatigue. You can apply millions of cycles you will have no change in the material properties. And if you have elastic deformation, you will be permanently in elastic behavior. But we know this is not what happens in fatigue. So we need to change the model somehow. So we have uh, decided to affect the damage threshold condition uh, by a residual strength function, which is a function which progressively lowers the strength of the material as you apply cycles based on a specific um, parameters, such as of course, the number of cycles applied, the reversion factor uh, of, each specific, of each specific stress state at each specific integration point, and also the maximum level of stress at each integration. So a little bit more detail about this reduction function. Basically, it's a, an irreversible factor. You cannot um, uh, go back. You cannot recuperate it. Well, go back. Um, it starts at the beginning of a simulation with, when you have a virgin material with uh, um, a reduction coefficient of one. And as you advance and you apply a number of cycles, then you progressively lower this uh, coefficient. Basically, the effect it has when you include it in the, inside this damage threshold condition is it either amplifies the current stress state until you reach the threshold and you go into the nonlinear domain, or you can see it uh, absolutely um, equivalent to reducing the maximum admissible stress inside your material. And the expression of this re uh, reduction function is related 100% uh, with the Wohler curves, with the stress number of cycle curves. What do I mean related? I mean, it depends on the same material parameters that you have to calculate. So uh, if we take a look, for instance, for a typical SN curve, okay, we normalize it with the maximum uh, tensile strength. 
And we, we see that for a specific level of maximum loading, what the SN curve is going to give us is what is the maximum fatigue life uh, that the material can withstand at that stress level. Okay, when we add into this equation also uh, the fatigue reduction function, what we are uh, doing is that we are obliging it to respect to different conditions. It should begin also with uh, in a level of one, which would be the static tensile strength of the material. And this function is necessarily having to pass through this intersection point over here, which tells us that we have reduced, we have lowered the strength of the material sufficiently that we are crossing the level of maximum stress. And this is when we are breaking our specimen at that specific material point. After that, the evolution that it has in between these two points, this will depend on the material parameters that we will have to calculate. Now, the expressions of these two functions, um, they are here, they're quite complicated. Just bear in mind that they depend on these specific material parameters. The formulation is a little bit more complex. Here you can see all the equations. Also, you can consult our publications and, and I will pass them to you if you're interested. But let's see um, how do we derive this material property. I have to say that uh, all of the models uh, in the fatigue world have this problem that uh, we have to calibrate material parameters. There is nobody who is free of this issue. So um, some time ago, uh, we decided to, to help ourselves to have an easier life. And we decided to um, develop an automatic calibration algorithm for these parameters. So we don't spend half of our life uh, tuning these parameters and the other one, etc. So in this sense, uh, the automatic calibration that we are using right now is based on the function fit from MATLAB. Um, it's, it has um, greatly simplified our life because in just a matter of minutes, you already have all the uh, material parameters that you need. You can see here, for instance, an example of calibration for the complex phase 800 steel, which is used in the automotive industry. And the, um, the material parameters derived from this automatic calibration process, as you can see over here. Just to mention that this is a material which is manufactured by ArcelorMittal and the material was tested inside the AutoCAD facilities. This is why we have uh, their partners with us in, in the Fatigue for Life project. This is why we have these uh, experimental data available. Now, some other examples of calibration for other materials, for instance, for the UC Bor 1500, which is another material used in the automotive industry, or the 22 manganese B5, another material used in the automotive industry. Both materials are uh, produced by ArcelorMittal, and also they have been tested by them. Um, and just to, uh, to finish this part, I want to uh, stress that we are not working with um, uh, discrete, with isolated SN curves, okay? When we are calibrating, these materials and we are calibrating specific um, uh, curves or specific reversion factors to experimental points, what we are actually doing is we are configuring this whole surface, okay, of the SN curve. So for instance, if in a numerical simulation, in a finite element simulation, you start to have damage due to fatigue, for instance, what will happen is that you will have um, right away a stress redistribution outside of the area where you have damage. This means that the stress state will be altered at those specific integration points inside those specific finite elements. This means that even if you begin with a stress ratio, for instance, of minus one or a zero one, you will have points that throughout the nonlinear process will change, will go away from that SN curves, which is specific for minus one. If you have a model which only takes into account discrete SN curves, you are going to be in an indetermination if you are going away from that uh, from that specific SN curve. This is why it's important to have a continuous, uh, well-defined surface of uh, stress number of cycles curve. Okay, and this is what what we are doing inside our uh, our formulation. Here you can also see, for instance, what uh, what the surface the reduction surface looks like when you intersect it with the SN surface for a specific level of, of maximum stress of 700 megapascal. Okay, now um, an important thing for us, and this I didn't mention in the state of the art, um, just let me let me say that when you are using the, the minor rule, the linear damage accumulation rule, although it is very widely used because it's very easy to use and it's a useful tool for the industry, uh, the minor rule is not always correct. It has been invalidated for several different types of materials. Why? Because the minor rule assumes that each cycle of loading 
has exactly the same um, degradation level, even if it's the first cycle of loading, even if it's the 100,000th cycle, cycle of loading. And this is not correct. It was demonstrated that the sequence in which different cyclic loadings are applied, so if you're in cycle one, or if you're in cycle 2000, or if you're in cycle 200,000, the degradation level is not the same. It can be different. So it's important to have models that are, are able to account for the load sequence effect and for the damage accumulation. And in this sense, we, we have been working together with uh, our colleagues at Eureka, which is the Catalan Research Center, uh, on designing an experimental campaign that can help us demonstrate that our model is, uh, is perfectly capable of uh, accounting for this load sequence effect. Now, um, when you start to, to do this type of analysis, an important thing that you have to make sure is that uh, you are quantifying correctly the change in the material properties for each different block or each different cyclic loading. For instance, here we have for, uh, in the first image, we have a, a, a determined a blue a cyclic loading with a level of maximum uh, stress, which is S max one. And after that, we, we apply a cyclic loading, which has a lower level of maximum stress, although we maintain the same reversion factor. In, in the image on the right, we are switching the ordering between these two. And in order to be able to account properly for, uh, what would be the, the fatigue life resulting from these two different load combinations, you need to make sure that you are quantifying correctly what's the change in the material properties for the first type of loading, for the second type of loading, etc. In order to do this, as I say, we've been working with Theorecat and we've done a study on the complex phase 800 steel. Um, this is the, the shape of the specimen which they tested, and this is the finite element model that we've used in our numerical simulation. And what we, we wanted to see is if you apply a determined number of cycles, which uh, we decided together is going to be three, uh, 31,000 cycles, sorry, uh, and then you break the sample monotonically, we were interested in finding out if uh, the maximum level of stress uh, attained by that specific specimen after having applied 31,000 cycles was the same as in the beginning, the same as for the virgin material or not. Uh, what we saw, what they saw um, experimentally, was that uh, there was a reduction inside the maximum stress uh, achieved inside the specimen of about 2%, 2 uh, 2.8%. Basically, uh, the, the maximum level of stress go, went down from 885 megapascals to about 865, let's say, um, as an average. OK, so. <clears throat> We started to do the same, uh, the same numerical simulation, um, where we applied the number of cycles, um, and then we, we broke the sample monotonically. And we took a look at what was the reduction factor after 31,000 cycles. And you can see here what are the areas which, are, um, um, which have reduced strength due to having applied this 31,000 cycle. Okay? And then we looked at what was the level of maximum uh, stress that we obtained in the numerical simulation uh, following this exact same uh, load history, let's say, and we found that we had a really good agreement in this sense. So uh, now we are working on, on designing the load sequence campaign experimentally, they are doing experiments, and then we have to, when we receive the results, we have to also reproduce them. Okay, um, now some something else that's very interesting for the high cycle fatigue domain. You see, high cycle fatigue has quite a big problem regarding um, experimental time needed to have a full characterization of a material. You will you need to do a lot of experimental tests. Basically, for each SN curve, you need about 19 specimens if you want to be um, uh, scrupulous and also have statistical effects accounted for. Um, and this takes a long time uh, to, to do these tests, specifically high cycle fatigue that has uh, lives of millions of cycles. You need about two weeks to a month of, um, of having a testing machine doing these tests. It's completely blocked for that material and that specific geometry. So um, uh, in the Fatigue for Light project um, that we have in our group, we have worked together with Eurecat and with ArcelorMittal to design um, a testing strategy which significantly lowers the experimental time needed to do fatigue um, testing, fatigue experimental characterization. And they have developed at Eurecat a rapid fatigue test, which is based on stiffness evolution. What does this consist in? Well, they apply blocks of cyclic loading of 6,000 cycles specifically, either at a ratio of 0, 1 or at a ratio of minus 1 with a specific loading frequency depending on the material. 
And what they are doing is that after each of these loading blocks, uh, they are doing a loading and un unloading of that specific specimen at 15% of the ultimate tensile strength. And this is done to detect what is the change in stiffness inside the material. And you can see here, for instance, that the loading history for this type of test is progressively higher, okay, the stress amplitude which is applied on the specimen. And as you uh, finish a block and then you, you check this change in the stiffness, you can see here that the displacement measurement varies um, after each load. So basically, if you are quantifying what is this change in the displacement measurement, uh, and you plot it against the stress amplitude, you can detect here what is the fatigue limit of this specific material. And for us, it was interesting when they developed this experimental technique to see if our model, if our formulation with high cycle fatigue was capable of uh, giving accurate results for this type of test also. And we began to do a calibration. It's specific for a TWIP steel. Um, and we basically began as you begin when you do a numerical simulation, calibrating the static parameters from the uh, engineering stress strain curve. You can see here um, experimental curve and it's very good adjustment with the numerical curve that we've obtained when we calibrated our uh, model parameters. Um, then we also calibrated our fatigue parameters for the minus one and for the zero one uh, curves. And then we proceeded to, to evaluate if you obtain the same behavior after doing this uh, rapid loading uh, history with the blocks of cyclic load. <coughs> Sorry. In the numerical, in the experimental um, analysis, they were able to detect uh, an increasing level of structural damage. What I mean with this is they computed uh, a specific damage parameter based on the, um, on the evolution of the stiffness this is uh, somehow to be understood as a macro structural damage, okay? It's not, um, not similar to the integration point damage that you would see in a constitutive law. And we wanted to see if at structural uh, level of the sample, we were able to obtain the same behavior. And what we've seen is that uh, we've gotten quite a good agreement uh, in between the numerical and the experimental part. I have to say that here we also, we only analyze the damage or the change in stiffness um, up uh, after a specific level of, of damage, which is 0 0.5, actually, here there's a typo, because this is what was uh, able to be detected uh, by them through um, the, the open eye, let's say, uh, and experimentally. And you can see here what is the adjustment in between the numerical and the, uh, and the experimental curve. And we've also had the opportunity here to test um, a cycle jump algorithm, which we have developed um, quite some years ago also, um, that helped us uh, significantly reduce the computational time of uh, high cycle fatigue simulation. Why? Because uh, when you do this simulation, applying the load 100,000 of cycles, um, cycle by cycle, you are going to be spending a lot of time with this, basically about 24 hours. And we wanted to see, okay, what happens when we uh, use cycle jump strategies? How are we able to reduce the computational time? And you can see here, uh, for instance, with um, cyclic jump or cycles, or jump step, let's say, of 100 cycles, uh, we are managing to, to lower the computational time until 10 hours. And, and this analysis um, can be further uh, pushed down, let's say, um, in terms of computational time. Now, um, Another um, issue that, uh, or another um, important value that they could determine from the experiments was what is the fatigue limit for this specific trip material? And uh, what they saw experimentally was that the fatigue limit was for them uh, 260 megapascals. And what we saw in the numerical simulation was that the fatigue limit, as, as I'm saying, structural level, measure structural level, was 258 uh, megapascals uh, inside the numerical simulation, which is, again, a fairly good agreement. Uh, if you are interested uh, in knowing more details about the specific experimental techniques, technique, which reduces the time, as I say, from, from testing for a minimum of two weeks until 15 hours of testing only, you can uh, take a look at, at the paper uh, which was published by our colleagues at Eureka. And if you're more interested in our numerical model and how this adjusts to this experimental behavior, you can uh, uh, attend or, or follow Luis Antonio Gonzalez, who is our PhD candidate working on this topic specifically. He will present his work regarding this topic in the Congress on Numerical Methods in Engineering in Gran Canaria in September. Okay, now let's go to uh, ultra-low cycle fatigue. 
Um, okay, I'm running out of time. I have so many things to, to talk to you about, so I'm going to go very fast. This is a model which was proposed in 2015, uh, and I don't want to get into details because we formulated it then, and we haven't used it for the past years because we didn't have research projects that complete, were specifically focused on this, okay? Just take into account that it uses kinematic plastic hardening coupled with isotropic plastic hardening. We have a specific constitutive law developed for that, and you can find the expressions which are based on the fracture energy uh, inside these papers that I will put here. Um, just to say that this work was developed during my PhD with uh, the supervision of Professor Stavi Martinez, Sergio Oyer, and, and Alex Bergat. Okay, now results regarding this. We used it for a, a project in, in oil and gas for piping uh, industry. And here you can see, for instance, uh, an elbow which was subjected to cyclic loading with some internal pressure. And you can see the, the adjustment between um, the numerical and experimental behavior, which was quite good. However, we saw that regarding the failure mode, there was a slight difference because of the level of internal pressure. And this motivated us to do a whole analysis of how the, the failure mode changed uh, with the level of internal pressure. You can see more results in, in the publications that I mentioned. I don't want to, to insist more here because I have a lot of news on other things. Okay, now uh, just to bear in mind that this ultra low cycle fatigue formulation, this specific constitutive law, is uh, perfectly capable of capturing um, a random cyclic loading, okay, and the effect that it has once you repeat it for a specific number of cycles, even with this very crazy hysteresis loops, okay? Now, low cycle fatigue. Low cycle fatigue, this gray area in between the plasticity and the damage domains. This, there is a big question that you have to answer uh, when you're speaking about this area. And this is, uh, if you're using a plastic damage model, which you should be using for low cycle fatigue, how much energy should you devote to plasticity and how much energy should you devote for damage? Now, during my PhD thesis, I proposed something over here, but uh, this, is, this was still quite a green approach. There was still, it could be quite developed. Uh, and we've worked a lot in, in the, this past year and a half uh, to develop strong coupling between plasticity and damage throughout plastic damage models. What do I mean with strong coupling? Why is it needed? You see, when you have a plastic damage model which is um, exhibiting weak coupling, what you have is a basic plasticity model and you compute the damage variable based on the level of plastic strain okay, that you have it in your model. And this is very good, it's very useful for a specific range of application, but what happens when you are interested in migrating, for instance, from low cycle fatigue to high cycle fatigue, you had some plasticity at the beginning, but then you, you are going towards a load history which uh, only will, needs to give damage, beha um, damage behavior inside your model. Well, if you're using a weakly coupled model, you won't be able to do this because if you stop plasticity, automatically this stops damage. So this is why we needed stroke coupling, why we needed to uh, integrate damage and plasticity at the same time. And we needed models which would be um, easily reduced at each one of the base phenomena, either reduced to plasticity, either reduced to damage if needed. In this sense, um, we've been working a lot on, on three different models. The initial one that we tested in 1996 was proposed by Viviana Lucioni. What was proposed in 1996, we didn't test it uh, because we were very young at that specific point. Um, but we've started to implement this and we've tested this model and we've seen some limitations. And this is why we decided to, to follow some other avenues. For instance, we, we investigated the associative plastic damage model proposed by Wu and Professor Cervera in 2016. And we've also proposed and formulated a brand new plastic damage model, um, very nice and interesting idea, which is a rule of mixture based plastic damage model proposed by Sergio Jimenez. Um, okay, now. If you are uh, looking at these three different plastic damage models, I've arranged them a bit different and you will understand uh, very soon why. Basically because I want to, to show to you there is a transition in between a less coupled behavior to a more coupled behavior. What do I mean with less coupled behavior? For instance, the rule of mixture based plastic damage model can allow two different surfaces, one for plasticity and one for damage, which vary, uh, which behave in a completely different way. The implicit plastic damage model by Viviana allows two different surfaces, but if they are um, moving in a two different way, you're losing convergence, you have instability in this model. This is a big limitation for this model. Now, uh, the associative plastic damage model proposed by uh, Wu and Cervera uh, only has one uh, yield surface, which is common for plastic damage um, for both plasticity and damage together. 
Okay, now uh, let's look at some simple evolution curves uh, in between the, the three different models. Um, what I want to, to say here is, for instance, for the rule of mixture-based damage model, the internal variables of the model are damage and normalized plastic dissipation, which is this kappa B variable. Normalized plastic dissipation means plastic dissipation is in a specific uh, load increment or the accumulated plastic load dissipation um, until that specific load increment divided by the total level of fractured energy. So when you have a level of plastic dissipation, which is normalized into zero two, you dissipated 20% of the fractured energy available for the material. When you are at a level of one for kappa P, you dissipated completely all the energy available. Um, for instance, the implicit plastic damage model of Viviana uh, had a, a, a normalized damage dissipation and a normalized plastic dissipation. These were the internal variables of the model. And for the associated plastic damage model, we have a sole uh, unique uh, dissipation, which quantifies both uh, damage and plasticity dissipation together inside this, uh, this specific pack. Okay, if you want to know more about this, Sergio and Alejandro, um, Sergio Jimenez and Alejandro Cornejo, they have been working intensively on this. Specifically, please pay attention to, to Sergio's PhD depends because he will have so many interesting cases to show and, and uh, he will be able to devote more time to speaking about it. Also, follow him at his talk in Oslo in, in Norway, where he will explain about this rule of mixtures uh, plastic damage model. Also, follow Alejandro's talk in Oslo um, because he will speak about the associated plastic dissipation model. Um, and you will you you can have more information about the specific equations that are behind each one of these models in a paper that we hope to publish very shortly uh, in the um, in the computer methods in applied mechanics and engineering journal. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to go very fast. Uh, the associative plastic damage model. We have a compliance matrix over here. Um, as I said, the the dissipation uh, variable is um, unique. Uh, normalized plastic damage dissipation. Uh, and this is based on a C parameter, uh, which varies between zero and one, as proposed by Professor uh, Wu and Cervera. Zero, fully plastic behavior, one, um, only damage stiffness degradation. We've applied this model, for instance, for a three point bending case, and we studied the crack mapped opening displacement with the reaction force, and you can see here the adjustment that we obtained. It was interesting, it was a good behavior. Uh, then we go to the uh, rule of mixture based plastic damage model. I have to say this is a model that I'm deeply in love with because the rule of mixture is something that has been used in the composite world since the 1960s. It's a very old uh, idea, but it has never been used for, for uh, describing the behavior of a homogeneous material. Because what we are doing here is we are assuming that in a specific volume of a uh, uh, homogeneous material, as I'm saying, we have a volumetric part which will behave according to plasticity laws, and we have the remaining, the complementary volume part, which will behave according to damage. And this is very, very interesting and very clever because it allows you to play with these uh, participations and understanding the, the behavior of the homogeneous material, not as a combination of materials, which was done for composites where you had fiber and matrix, but as a combination of constitutive laws, of constitutive behaviors. And the interesting thing here, as I said, complementary and, and volumetric participation for the damage and plasticity, is that this volumetric participation is not fixed. It's evolutive throughout the nonlinear process. So if you have a material which starts to, to exhibit plasticity at the beginning of the nonlinear processes, but later on migrates into a damage behavior, or a combination of these two, this model is perfectly capable of, of uh, capturing this. This is, this is a very, very important uh, characteristic. So, uh, when we are dealing with progressive redistribution of the volumetric participation as a function of this damage internal variable, we have uh, developed, we have proposed different transition function, functions available, linear, exponential, and potential. And here you can see the variation of the uh, damage and plasticity participation, take into account that damage is, uh, KV is this damage participation, and KP is this plasticity participation, and you can see how they can vary throughout uh, a specific numerical simulation. You can choose in between these different laws. Just an example for linear softening laws, when you combine damage and plasticity and you use a linear transition between damage and plasticity, I don't want to insist here. Another test that we made, which is a typical test, Carson and Gerson for, for plastic damage models. And you can see here the behavior under tensile and under compressive. Also important to know, these models that meet 
uh, different behavior and the tensile behavior and different curves, hardening, softening, whatever you need in the compression behavior, okay? Um, now, when we compare, for instance, the three-point bending for the associative plastic damage model with the rule of mixture-based damage model, uh, both of them have um, their, their particularities and one of them can adjust better to a specific case compared to the other. Let's say that you have a lot of tools that you can use uh, when you want to simulate a specific case here. Another case that we did, which was compressive behavior, uh, again, a comparison between the associative plastic and, and rule of mixtures. Um, I don't want to read this here again, but let's just say that we also need some transition cases, because as I said, it's important for us to be able to migrate from monotonic with fatigue, fatigue monotonic, or combinations of cyclic loading. This is why we need transitions from plasticity to damage, damage to plasticity, and we need specific transition function in between these models just to make sure that we don't recuperate, we don't go back on the level of plastic strain, it's fixed, and we don't go back on the level of damage once we switch from a process to the other. And here, for instance, you can see uh, what's the, um, an interesting case, for instance, when you apply this type of loading and you begin with a completely plastic behavior, then you begin to have, um, you, you pass into transition zone where you have plasticity accumulated with damage, and you continue up to a point where you begin to exhibit exclusively damage, okay? This is perfectly possible with this model. And another combination where we have cyclic loading, 10,000 cycles applied. And after that, we break the sample monotonically. And during these cycles, we, we do this unloading uh, here where you can see how the behavior changes from plasticity, plasticity with damage. And in the end, we only exhibit a uh, damage behavior in the part where softening is uh, obviously um, exhibited. Okay, future work. What about the manufacturing processes? Well, Alejandro Cornejo has been working a lot on this, um, on developing specific models inside Kratos uh, regarding metal forming, because this is an important um, process that we need to take into account when addressing fatigue behavior. You can see here different cases for stamping simulation, etc. cetera. Um, then about thermal fatigue, this is also a topic where we are very interested in. This is why we couple the solver, the mechanical solver with the thermal solver, uh, and we uh, that done some simulation, very preliminary, where you apply heat flux, for instance, on this lower control arm on this edge, and you look at the evolution of the temperature, and you look at the evolution of the von Mises stresses um, as this heat flux increases. And here you can see, for instance, uh, the deformed shape of this uh, suspension arm um, a bit exaggerated, of course, when you continue applying this, this load. Okay, short comment on composites, okay? <clears throat> I'm finishing. Um, now, on composites, we've been also working, but um, to be honest, this is such a, um, a wide topic that we could probably devote one or two seminars just to speak specifically about uh, fatigue and composites. Um, just to, to let you know uh, what we've been doing inside this area. Uh, we've dedicated effort to coupling the high cycle fatigue formulation with the serial parallel rule of mixtures, which was developed also in our group back in 2008, I would say. Um, also, we've been dedicating effort at deriving reliable fatigue data from experimental tests. You would think this is such a simple issue, but it's not, because we, it's very difficult to have SN uh, curves, for instance, for the high cycle fatigue domain. Um, for the fib fiber, for the matrix, in order to do a good composition, in order to isolate uh, well, what is the cyclic behavior of each component so that you have a good control of what is the cyclic behavior of each uh, of the composite. This is very, very complicated to do. And, and Barbara, our PhD student, has been working on this, on, on how to collect uh, this data. Also, the lamination. It's a very important phenomena uh, for composite materials. And um, Ali has been dedicating the effort into formulating uh, the lamination model for composite materials. If you are interested in these topics and you want to pursue and find out more news from us on our developments, please pay attention to Barbara's talk inside the Congress on Numerical Methods in Engineering in September also. Uh, Barbara has been working, collaborating with uh, scientists from the Research Institute of Sweden from RISE um, on the behavior uh, of fatigue behavior of uh, carbon fiber uh, reinforced polymer, uh, numerical versus experimental. Also, um, Ali's talk, um, which is, will be focused on numerical investigation of fatigue life behavior in glare structures, a damage assessment approach. He will present also uh, at the conference in Gran Canaria. And um, please, if, as I say, if you're interested, uh, please assist at their talks. Okay, nothing more from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm open to questions if you have them.
Thank you very much, Lucia. Very nice presentation. Uh, you perfectly fit the time. Thank you again for that. Uh, I think that we have at least five minutes or, or more to, to discuss or to comment on, on the presentation of Lucia. Is anybody interested in asking? Yeah. One curiosity. Um, when you talked about uh, the different regimes of ultra low cycle fatigue, low cycle fatigue, and high cycle fatigue, um, can you remember? I mean, maybe you already said that, but I, I, I now don't remember it. How do you distinguish? I mean, which is the range between those uh, different types of, of cycling fatigues? Yeah, um, basically, the, the, um, the difference is when you look at the experimental behavior or what you see in the typical uh, cyclic test, let's say, when you are dealing with high cycle fatigue, you will have failures that are um, uh, due to having applied a load which induces elastic deformation. So you will not observe on your specimen any plastic deformation, okay, any permanent change in the shape. However, um, if you continue to apply the cyclic loading, you will obtain the brittle failure, complete failure of the specimen uh, after a determined number of cycles. This is what's considered high cycle fatigue. When you go on, well, the easiest to identify, I would, I would say, other type of fatigue in the ultra low cycle uh, regime is when you have very high level of plastic deformation induced inside your material due to the cyclic loading uh, and you, you fracture the specimen, you completely break the sample after uh, maybe dozens of cycles or hundreds of cycles. In between these two areas, you normally have, um, you observe experimentally, I would say, um, a combination in between change in stiffness, uh, because as you continue to apply the cyclic loading, there's a variation over there in, in, the, in the slope of, of loading and unloading. So this will signal to you that you have damage. And also you will observe that you have changes in, in, the, um, in the deformed shape of the specimen. You have permanent deformation, plastic deformations, which uh, belong to a plasticity behavior. Okay, thank you very much. That's a very good explanation. Yeah, I understood perfectly. Um, Fernando, you had a question. I can unmute you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lucia, for your great presentation. Very, very interesting. Um, I have a question on the first part regarding the, the calibration. Um, if I understood well, uh, you have uh, some points uh, from the experimental tests, and then you, well, you actually, you, you, you mentioned that you have a, a calibration procedure to fit this, this smooth curves, right? But yeah. I observed that you have some, there's uh, some scatter uh, in the experimental data, and if I understood well, you also mentioned that you have some statistical effects, as you call them, if I, if I understood well, and you also said that, that in general, when uh, you are characterizing some uh, material, uh, a number of specimens are required, right? So yeah. I guess you will have some scatter in the re experimental results. My question is, how do you deal with that scatter? Because um, not only for calibrating your your uh, your in curves, but also when applying your models, because uh, the, the the models are deterministic, but reality yeah. let's say reality is not deterministic. You have some. Do you work? Do you consider that some way? Uh, do you have something like a confidence interval? Is there a way to to account for this uh, real, let's say, uh, non-deterministic uh, behavior? Yeah, there are there are several ways actually to to incorporate inside the modeling approach the statistical effects. Um, as you say, when we receive these experimental results, we always observe scatter, so there are always uh, some some statistical effects over there. Uh, when we are doing the basic calibration for our uh, high cycle fatigue deterministic model, we are averaging with the fit um, routine inside MATLAB um, the a correct approximation, let's say, uh, of, of those experimental points. But um, we can also do, for instance, weighted calibration. And this is something that I didn't mention. For instance, when we receive the experimental points, we have some points which belong to, to the low cycle fatigue regime and some points which belong to the high cycle fatigue regime with higher fatigue lives, let's say. And um, sometimes it's it's not that easy to, to find a, a curve that correctly approximates the entire fatigue regime from low to high. 
But for instance, if we know that we are calibrating for a high cycle fatigue domain, then we can give more weight to the points in the with millions of cycles in the lower part, let's say, of, of the curve. And we can decide to better approximate that area as that would be the area where we will focus our numerical simulations. And the other way around, when we have low cycle fatigue uh, and we want to do a calibration for low cycle fatigue, we give more weight to the parts on the upper part of the curve and we dedicate more effort to approximate correctly with that part because the simulations that we will do will be in that area. Now, um, we are approximating with this fit routine in MATLAB just uh, that specific uh, SN curve for that specific stress ratio that we obtain experimentally. But um, for instance, we can have um, probabilistic SN curves, which are later on um, treated, I would say, uh, with different probabilistic models. This, this is not something that we have done in our group, but we are collaborating with research groups who are doing, where they are deriving this type of probabilistic SN curves. And then uh, once they do this probabilistic analysis, they can give to us what is the curve that they want us to approximate. And we input inside our deterministic model that uh, those uh, experimental points which take into account that uh, that probabilistic effect. This is one way in which we can account for this, but also another way is, as you say, using these um, tolerance bands, I would say, which give you, uh, let's say, a 5% probability of occurrence, a 95% probability of occurrence. So you have like a superior and an inferior band, and you can decide if you want to do the simulation with this specific level of reliability, 5% or 95%, and you calibrate uh, those specific um, uh, curves, you know, and when you, you run the numerical simulation, you input the material parameters for that specific reliability curve of 95%. This is uh, our approach. Okay, thank you. I guess what the common or um, conventional or easy way of uh, going to uh, when probabilistic is with Monte Carlo, something uh, I would say yeah. approaches, but in this case, yeah. I guess that computational time is also an issue. So you have to work with something like this, this simplifications. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, is there any other short question? If there are no more comments or questions, then let's close the session here. Thank you again, Lucia, for the nice presentation. And thank you all for attending today. And I hope to see you all in next week in the next session of the seminar course. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.